So I'm Jim Schwartz. I'm the uh, agronomy education lead for 360 Yield Center. That guy right up there is Ron Lloyd. Ron is the agronomy lead for 360 Yield Center. I live in uh, north central Indiana, north of Indianapolis. Uh, we're dry. Anybody here from northeast Indiana area, Ohio, Michigan? Dry. Dry. Um, we've been going week to week on rainfall, needing it every week, and we haven't gotten it for two weeks. So it's quite different from out here. Um, Ron is from... I, Ron, I never, is it central Illinois or southern Illinois? Illinois? It's central Illinois. Now, the guys north of you say you're from southern Illinois. Well, people here that are from here would say I'm from southern Illinois because <laughs> southern Illinois starts 30 miles south wherever you live. All right. So, so you're so from? I'm from central Illinois. Okay, just 20 miles it. south of Springfield. All right. So we're going to talk to you today about plant health and how plant health relates to corn yield. But before I do that, I got to tell you a story. And it's a story about an airplane ride and information. Okay. Now, those are my two sons. My, I've coached my sons in basketball. They play varsity boys basketball. I've coached varsity basketball for eight or nine years. And uh, that's my oldest is in the middle. He's about 6'7". And my youngest, who's going off to Purdue this year, he's about 6'5". So they're centers, right? And they love, they love Tim Duncan. Tim Duncan from the San Antonio Spurs is their favorite player. By the way, when you coach your own kids, that's why I... You see, I'm in there intensively coaching and he's paying absolutely no attention to me whatsoever. That's what happens. But in any event, they love Tim Duncan. So this past year, we decided for Christmas, we would give them a trip to San Antonio to go watch the Spurs game. So that meant, so they could watch Tim Duncan. So that meant we had to fly down to Dallas and then fly from Dallas to San Antonio. Now we happened to decide to do this on December 28th. For those of you who remember December 28th, this is what happened on December 28th. So as we approach Dallas, I notice we're circling and circling, and I, I lean over my wife and I go, this isn't good. And sure enough, about a minute later, the pilot came on and she said, well, she said there are too many shear winds at DFW, so we're going to have to divert because we only have nine minutes of fuel left. Oh, it gets better. This is a true story. So my wife and my kids look at me, I'm like, we're okay, everything's fine. So about a minute later, she comes back on the intercom. She goes, yep, hey, we're going to divert to Love Field. Everything's fine. Should be landing in 15 minutes. <laughs> that was, and you know what? I share that story with you because that was information I did not need, okay? You didn't have to tell me that. We could have landed. Now my kids are scared to death, all right? So hopefully the information we share with you today is a little more valuable than that. I'm going to talk to you about plant health as it relates to nutrition, all right? And then Ron's going to talk to you a little bit about respiration, photosynthesis, and how that's important in plant health as well. Now, I love Abe Lincoln. I've got a book full of his quotes. Here's a couple of my favorites. He said, if I had six hours to sharpen an ax, I'd spend, I'm sorry, if I had six hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend four hours sharpening my ax. And what's he saying? I'm going to prepare, right? I'm going to I'm going to prepare and learn and get ready to do the, uh, do the chopping. And really, that's why you're here today, right? You're here to sharpen your ax. So I congratulate you for being here. The other thing I love what he said, and I think that second quote is kind of Abe Lincoln's way of saying, really smart people think outside the box. And you've probably seen some outside the box things today. So keep thinking outside the box for ways to uh, apply them to your operation. So. Switching gears, how, how many of you have seen Dr. Fred Belo's Seven Wonders of the Corn Yield World? That's the list in rank order, right? Now, as you look at that list, I thought it's kind of interesting. There's about four of those at least, and we could argue about that even. Maybe there's more. There's about four of these that I think have a direct correlation to plant health. Nitrogen, which we'll talk about in a minute. Previous crop, because that has a lot to do with inoculum and residue. Tillage, what you do with that residue and then growth regulators. And Ron will actually touch on that in a little bit. But all four of those things really have a direct correlation to plant health. And you could even argue maybe a few more of those do. But that's the importance of plant health as it relates to corn yield. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk to you about a study from Dr. Jerry Hatfield. He's adjunct at Iowa State. And he did a soil biological fertility study. And one of the quotes out of that study I thought was really interesting. Nutrient supply during the grain filling or fruit development period is critical to high yielding crops. In other words, making sure that crop has the nutrition it needs while it's filling the grain is really, really important. Here's one of the charts he used. And I thought it was really interesting. That top line is stabilized nitrogen. 
the middle line is unstabilized UAN, and that bottom line is a check. And what those lines are is chlorophyll production in the corn plant over time. So what it's showing is chlorophyll production is much higher when we have nitrogen nutrition available to the plant. Now, the question you may ask is, oh, oop de doo but does that mean there's more yield? And the answer is yes, more chlorophyll. There is a direct correlation between chlorophyll production and yield. And Ron's going to talk about this, but chlorophyll captures sunlight to produce those sugars. So yes, more chlorophyll means more yield. So everything we can do to increase chlorophyll production helps with yield. Part of the results of his study also, he developed this, this it's called a senescence index. <clears throat> and the senescence index basically says that's three different years of data that says the longer we keep those plants green and healthy and alive, the higher the yield. And that's why we're here to talk about plant health, keeping the nutrients supplied to the grain during that critical grain filling period is critical for plant health and critical for high yield. For those of you, if you got a camera and you're interested in something to read, I would encourage you to go print this off, take a picture of it. This is Dr. Below's study, uh, Dr. Ross Bender helped him with this and a number of other people. It is an excellent article. It's, I don't know if it's 10, 15 pages long. I printed it off. It's easy to read. It is great information. It's a new study about nutrition as it relates to plants. Two of the quotes I pulled out that I thought were really interesting as it relates to us today. Effectively minimizing nutrient stress requires matching nutrient supply with plants, especially in high yielding conditions. And the second quote, we'll dig into this, matching corn micronutrient needs in high yielding conditions clearly requires supplying nutrient sources and rates that can meet crop needs during key growth stages. In other words, you got to give the plant what it needs when it needs it. So the question is, well, when does it need it? And that was what they set out to study when they, when they began this process. Now, those of you, this is one of the slides from that study. And if you've been around 360 any length of time, you've seen us quote this slide 100 times. And we talk about the nitrogen uptake curve. But I want to focus for a minute on the backside of that curve, all right? And that's, those are called repartitioning curves. In other words, that's what the plant does naturally to fill grain. And you can see, when you see that line go down, and you see the yellow area go down, what that means is the plant is repartitioning nitrogen from stalks and leaf sheets to fill grain. This past Saturday, we, we spoke to Dr. Bilo and said, all right, can we change those slopes? Can we alter that curve? And he said, maybe a little, but not much. By that, we mean, what he means is that corn plant is going to take from Peter to pay Paul. So it's really important for that plant to have plenty of nitrogen so that when it does take it, right, there's still something left in the gas tank for other needs. And here's what I mean by that. This is a great picture. This is on your left is one method of application. On your right, that's a wide drop application. And you can see, and I want to focus on this a minute, the difference in the plant health. But the thing I want you to think about, look at the light penetration in the canopy. The only difference there, this is side by side, is nitrogen. But look at what happens when the health deteriorates. Look at the sunlight penetration. Sunlight drives chlorophyll production. Chlorophyll production drives yield. So it's really important to have that nutrition to keep it healthy, to intercept more sunlight, to drive chlorophyll production for more yield. This is a picture I took a couple years ago in West Lafayette, Indiana. I was standing right in the middle of the row. No nitrogen. Not, I'm sorry, we didn't do a side dress with wide drop. We did where you see that green coloration. And it's a great example of what happens when that repartitioning starts taking place if you've got enough in the tank versus if you don't. That's why plant health and nitrogen are so important. But I want to spend a little more time now talking to you about micronutrients, boron and zinc. Okay? And the reason I want to talk to you about boron and zinc is they're the two most common micronutrient deficiencies in the world. Now you might ask, why? Why are boron and zinc so important and why are we seeing more deficiencies? I think the answer is because we're growing more corn, right? And when we, all micronutrients, they have to be mineralized from your organic matter. And when we're growing 150 bushel corn, it's a lot easier to supply those needs than when we're growing 250 bushel corn, okay? Here's zinc from below study. Here's zinc's uptake curve. And you look, all right, about 30% of that zinc is repartitioned. But the thing I want you to look at there too is the blue, right? That's grain. Corn grain has a huge sink for zinc. It needs a lot of zinc because there's specific protein in grain. If that corn plant doesn't have enough zinc at that time, 
when it repartitions about 30% of it to fill the grain, that's going to be a problem. Boron is really unique. Boron has a very unique uptake curve. It's um, Dr. Bender in his paper. He called it the official nutrient of flowering. And you can see right about flowering, right? There's a repartitioning that takes place to make sure that plant has enough. So it's really important to make sure our plants have enough boron during flowering. But the other thing I want you to look at in that chart is the steepness of those curves, all right? Because when you dig into that paper, here's what you find, right? 71% of zinc is taken up over only one, uh, one third of the growing season. 65% of boron is taken up over one fifth of the growing season. In other words, that's a really narrow window for us to get these micronutrients into the plant. And if you think about it, if they have to be mineralized from your organic matter, all right, organic matter is a process that requires moisture, temperature, oxygen, proper pH. So what happens if you're in one of those really rapid uptake phases for boron and you're in a three week dry window? That's not very good conditions for mineralization. And so that's a real challenge to you as a corn grower to maintain your high yields if we're not getting good mineralization and it leads to issues down the road. Real quick, zinc and boron. Zinc is a positively charged ion. That's how it gets into the corn plant. Your soils are negatively charged. And so it moves into the plant via a process called diffusion. It doesn't move very much in the soil. It's from an area of high concentration to low concentration. I want you to look at that fourth bullet point. Zinc is really important in chlorophyll production. So if zinc's important to chlorophyll and chlorophyll leads to more yield, all right, and more plant health, it's really important to make sure we have zinc. And remember, when we've got to have it, we've got to have it during that grain filling period. All right, the other thing is to recognize the deficiencies, high pH soils, low organic matter soils. And the reason low organic matter soils is because you have to mineralize it out of your organic matter, all right. High, high phosphorus levels, for those of you who use uh, manure, that has a lot of phosphorus that can actually tie up zinc. So you can have a soil test level that has plenty of zinc, but it may not get into the plant. And then cold, wet soils or lack of biological activity. Boron is completely different. Boron has a triple negative valency. So it's very mobile in your soil. Not quite as mobile as nitrates, but it's mobile in your soil. You have to mineralize it from organic matter. I want you to focus on the third bullet there. Boron helps promote auxins, all right, and auxins promote plant health and stay green. So if, I said promote, preserve. So if boron is required to preserve auxins, then auxins promote plant health, and plant health promotes chlorophyll growth. Chlor chlorophyll improvement means more yield. It's really important, right? Boron deficiencies, low organic matter soils. If you have a coarse textured soil, all right, because boron's mobile, it can move out in a heavy rainfall, all right, and in pH. And I want to talk to you a little bit about pH. These charts, I'm going to show you a couple of charts. So this is from International Plant Nutrition Institute. It was on a webinar this past spring. And every five years, they do a meta study. And they look at all the data they get in. That blue bar is 2001. The red bar is 2005. The green bar is 2010. The net yellow bar is 2015. That's over 5 million soil samples. And the thing you need to understand is when they had the webinar, they said, these are the best growers. So this is data from the best growers, not just everybody. These are the best growers, 5 million soil samples. And what I want you to look at is if you look at the pH range, that optimum range, about half the soil samples in North America came back in the optimum range, which means what? Half of them came back suboptimum, all right? In the Corn Belt, it's about the same, all right? Half the soil tests are in the optimum range, which means half of them are suboptimum. And look, I get, I completely understand you know, the landlord doesn't want to buy lime, and I get that. I, I understand why you might have some lower soil pHs. But here's the impact, because that's the environment we're operating in, right? So like it or don't like it, those are the environments we operate in. Well, look at what happens to boron and zinc when we have those high pHs. The availability goes way down. So now we have to mineralize it, and we have a very narrow window, a fifth, one-fifth of the growing season for boron, right? And if our soils are low and we have high pHs, it really creates some issues that we have to deal with. This is, uh, I have a friend that works for Anel Great Lakes Lab who shared these slides with me, all right? And I said, do you have some metadata from all your soil tests in the, in the Great Lakes region, all right? And this is thousands and thousands of soil tests now. And that blue line indicates deficient samples for boron. Guess what? It's becoming more of an issue, all right? I have a friend that works for a seed company said they, 
they had 10 research locations they went and sampled. Nine of the 10 locations, and by the way, research locations are about, the, you try to find the best spot in the world to, to have a research location. Nine of his 10 locations showed a boron deficiency. This is a grower I deal with in West Central Indiana, three and a half percent organic matter soil. Really good growers, top shelf growers, very well drained soil. They're, they tile everything. And he went out and started testing for zinc and boron and look what he found. He was pretty surprised, I think, at the amount and number of samples that came back deficient for zinc and boron. And I want to, I want to lay this out there right now. Soil testing for micronutrients is hard. It, we're dealing with very small quantities, parts per million. So if there's a little bit of an error, right, that, that can have a big impact. So we'll talk about soil and tissue testing in a minute, but it, it is a challenge to soil test for micronutrients. Here's zinc. And again, you can see if you look at that blue line, zinc deficiencies continue to increase. Back to that Plant Nutrition Institute study. All right, this is zinc. If you look at those bars, where do you see the biggest increase? You see the biggest increase of soil sample results coming back at less than one part per million. That's an issue, right? That's an issue. If you look at that by state, this is the percent of samples that came back deficient. All right, for zinc or less than one part per million, right? We see there's a pretty significant number in most areas. And keep in mind, these are the best corn growers sending in their data. These are the best corn growers. So what does that mean? Well, the good news is when we think about zinc and boron, they're micronutrients. We don't need a lot to grow a big crop. It doesn't mean they're not important. It just means we don't need a lot to grow a big crop. Less than a pound, right? If you look at that, not a whole lot. So that means we can do something about it if we need to. But what you don't want to do is wait until you see pictures like this to do something about it. I took these pictures, that's boron, I'm sorry, that's potassium on the left, that is sulfur in the middle, that's zinc on the right, okay? We don't want to get to this point, so we want to go out and be proactive and beat it to the punch. You want to give the plant what it wants when it wants it. That's what that study showed earlier on. Now I ask you a question, what's wrong with this cornfield? This is a field from a farm, central Indiana. If you look at this field, do you see anything wrong? Neither do I, right? And not always are we gonna have a warning sign pop up and go, caution, warning, we've got a deficiency, you need to do something about it. But when I went in and sampled this field right here, that's what we found right there, right? By the way, this is from one of the farms where we had those red boxes so it doesn't surprise us that we're starting to see boron deficiency. So we went in and made a supplemental application, all right? And look at what we did. We took it from low up to sufficient and high by making an application. So the good news about micronutrient deficiencies is you can do something about it because you don't need a lot to do it. Now, I'm you all just came from Jim Hedges' presentation talking about undercover and foliar applications. Well, you can apply micronutrients in a foliar application. Now, I'll say this true, zinc, you can do a row starter with zinc, no problem, good methodology, you have no issues with it at all. Boron, you can't really do in a row starter because it's toxic, okay? So I have no issues at all with zinc in a row starter. But if you get out and you tissue test and you find your tissue tests are low, it's too late for a row starter. So you can come in with undercover, or some other method and apply a foliar product. But here's why I put this up here. How did the good Lord create that corn plant? On the top of the corn leaf, he created something called a cuticle, right? And what's the job of the cuticle? They keep stuff out. That's what the cuticle wants to do. So the top side of the leaf has a heavier cuticle. So what if we can spray underneath the side of the leaf? What that chart, what that box showed you, and I pulled that right from the Midwest Labs Foliar Nutrition Handbook, is that there are environmental conditions that favor application of nutrients, which means, right, that there's differences in the plant and the leaf and all that. So also in the leaf structure, there's differences. So what if we can change where we apply it? The other thing I want you to think about is that not all nutrients are absorbed at the same rate when you apply them. So how we apply them, if we can keep them on longer, all right, that is a benefit to us. Think about where you apply those nutrients, rainfall washing off the top of the leaf or not. Maybe there's some other benefits there to be had. I'll tell you a story, and I'm about done. Tell you a story about a, a player I've had for a number of years named Riley. Riley is, uh, he is actually number 11 there. He was national homeschool hurling champion this past year. He is an exceptional athlete, okay? 
He is one of the best defenders I've ever coached. And when he plays basketball, he pours his heart and his guts on the floor. He is one of the hardest working young men I've ever coached. Riley came to us this past year and said, my goal is to play Division II basketball. And we said, hey, that is fantastic, Riley. In order to do that, I think you're going to need to do a couple things. You're going to have to shoot better, and you're going to have to improve your ball handling. So when we told Riley that, he and his parents decided that was what he was going to focus on, and he went out and he hired a trainer to help him with his ball handling. He went to a shooting coach to help him with his shot because he wants to play Division II basketball. He wants to do all the things necessary to play Division II basketball. You know what? For you all, Division II basketball may be 300 bushel corn or 250 bushel corn or 220 bushel corn. But in order to play Division II basketball, you've got to go out and do the things that Riley's doing to reach those goals. And that may mean micronutrients. That may mean a foliar application. It may mean something else. But that's why you're here, really, because you want to do better, just like Riley did, to reach his goals. And you all have goals as well. So here's my three final takeaway points. Nutrient supply during grain filling is critically important for plant health and high yield. And remember what we talked about we have narrow uptake periods, especially for micronutrients. If, it's, if we have to mineralize it and it's not available, then it's a problem. Secondly, soil and tissue test to understand what's going on in your field. And here's why I say that. You can have a soil test that is perfectly normal for a particular nutrient. But in the case of boron, for instance, boron gets to that plant in mass flow, all right? That picture I showed you with the potassium deficiency, that soil had plenty of potassium. But it wasn't getting into the plant because it was dry. So soil test to find out if it's there, that doesn't mean you have enough. And then tissue test to find out if it's getting into the plant. Zinc, for instance, you can soil test and have plenty of zinc. If you have really high levels of phosphorus, it may not get there because it's, it's forming a compound that makes it unavailable to the plant. So soil test and tissue test. Conversely, I will tell you that you can tissue test and have perfectly fine levels. Let's, let's take nitrogen. Maybe you got 5% saturation in your leaf for nitrogen, which is great. But then you go and soil test and you find out you've got two parts per million. That's a problem, right? If you only tissue test, you think you're fine, but you're about to run out of gas and you don't want to run out of gas. So that's why it's important to do both to find those correlations that exist and make sure you're being proactive because micronutrient deficiencies are increasing as we grow more corn and we want to be proactive to intercept them before we see those deficiencies showing up, all right? So now I'm going to turn it over to Ron. So I've talked to you about nutrition and plant health driving yield. So Ron's going to talk to you a little bit about some different factors and how they drive plant health and drive yield. All right, thanks, Jim. Well, hey, thanks everybody for uh, coming out with us today. Mitch, I'm gonna try to stand over here just so I've got a lot of builds. We're gonna see if I can get this to work. Yeah, I think this will work. Before, uh, before I jump in and talk about plant health and photosynthesis and all this stuff that I'm sure you got up early for to come listen to, I wanna tell a little story. So it's around Christmas time and there's a family that's gathered together to enjoy a meal together and they're getting ready to prepare that meal. And there's a young little girl, I don't know, probably eight or nine years old, that says to her mom, Mom, can I help? I'd like to learn how to help cook the meal. And her mom says, absolutely. So they're in the kitchen. Mom gets the ham out, and she cuts part of the ham off, puts it in a separate dish, puts the big part in another dish. And she starts to season and get things going, get the brown sugar. And the little girl stops her and says, Mom, why'd you cut part of that ham off? And the mom says, you know, why don't you go ask Grandma? She's the one that taught me, not real sure. So she goes over to grandma and says, grandma, why do you cut part of the ham off and put it in a separate dish to cook it? And grandma says, you know, my mom, your great grandma taught me how to do it. She's in the other room, why don't you go ask her? So she goes into the other room and goes up to her great grandma and says, grandma, why do you cut part of the ham off and put it in a separate dish to cook? And her grandma kind of smiles and kind of chuckles and says, you know, when your grandpa and I first got married, we had a really small stove and the full ham wouldn't fit in it, right? <clears throat> so what's the point of that story? Well, I heard some of you chuckle. I laughed when I first heard that, that joke because I can relate. You know, I grew up on the farm with my grandfather who's still on the farm. Uh, my boys are 21 and 19 and so their great grandpa is still around. He taught me about everything that I knew for a long time about farming. 
And there was years and years went by that I would continue to do the same thing. And eventually I might say, why am I doing it this way? And it's not that grandpa was wrong, but technology changes and time changes. And that's really why we're all here together at Proving Grounds, right? To look at new technologies, to challenge each other, to think about how we can do things differently. Because a lot of things have changed over time. And a lot of the traditional thinking, and, and Jim said it, and I talked to Dr. Bilo a lot, um, know him very well. And, you know, he's made that comment. When we calibrated a lot of things years ago with soil labs, what were we growing for corn? We're growing 100 bushel corn. Maybe national average was 100 bushels back in the 60s and the 70s. But things have changed, and that's what I really want to challenge us with today. I want to go back to the basics a little bit and talk about some of the plant biology part and then bring it to the end because I'm involved in our farming operation too. And when Jim and I were talking about our presentation, I said we've got to have tangible things that we can all take home and do and take action and not just have an academic session. So I want to make sure that we uh, live up to that. So let's just talk a little bit. These are going to be pretty basic, kind of back to, to biology 101. Uh, but we know that photosynthesis is critical for crop growth and development, right? Let's go back to our, to our uh, grade school science class and let's talk about what is photosynthesis and what is that formula. Well, we know that the plant takes in carbon dioxide and it takes in water. It captures radiant energy from the sun in the form of sunlight. And then it converts all that inside the plant and it kicks out oxygen, but then it makes simple sugar. It makes glucose. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. That's the really basic formula. So what does that mean? Well, these foods and these sugars that it creates are the energy source. If you think about it, everything we do to manage our crop is really to manage photosynthesis. Jim talked a lot about proper nutrition. The thing I'm not talking about is all the complexity in that formula inside the plant. It's not just as easy as it takes in carbon dioxide and water and poof, we magically have those. It doesn't just, you know, dissociate and associate those molecules without any other energy. It needs nitrogen. It needs boron. It needs zinc. It needs calcium. It needs magnesium. It needs copper. It needs all these other nutrients that are critical for it to do that. And if it doesn't have those, what happens? Well, that becomes a limiting factor. And nitrogen is the most key. Here's another thing to think about. Later in the plant's life, a lot of this corn around here, we've got a little bit later planted stuff that's at V6 to V10, but most of this corn is tasseled, is already pollinated. When you think about a corn plant that is putting its tassel out or is about fully grown, about 70% of the carbohydrates, the sugars that are made in that plant, that photosynthesis happens from the ear leaf up. That's the sweet spot. That's what we've got to protect. So keep that in mind as we talk about this, <clears throat> and a lot of the things you're going to see as you go around the trams today, that's what 360 thinks about a lot, is how do I protect that ear leaf up in corn? And we'll talk about some other crops here in a little bit. You know, you might ask yourself, well, yeah, I get it, that sugar is needed for the plant to do its business, but how important is it? Do I really need that much? The interesting thing is, when you guys take your grain to the market, when you go to the elevator, guess what? Each of those kernels has about 72% of sugars in them, of starch, right? That's what they're made up of. 72% of that kernel is starch. Where did that starch come from? It came from photosynthesis. Because what happens is that plant makes that glucose, that sugar, and then it chains it together. That's what starch is. It's just those sugars that it chains together. And that's what carbohydrates are, are just those chains of sugars and starches. The important thing that I really want you to leave with, and then we'll talk about what do we do about it, are stresses. Any kind of stress during the growing season can greatly impact yield because it impacts photosynthesis, right? Any kind of stress. And we're gonna go into a lot more detail about it. And the next is maximizing light through row spacing. Greg talked about this today. It's row spacing, it's, it's plant spacing, it's population, and it's also just keeping it healthy. You know, I, I'm not here to talk about row spacing and population, but I will say this. You know, I've got a lot of friends and neighbors and others that I've worked with through the years that have gone to narrow rows over time. And many of them have gone back. And why do you think that is? Well, they didn't see a yield difference. Why do you think that is? Capturing light was not their limiting factor. That wasn't what was holding their yields back from getting more. It was other things. 
Sometimes we make one change in our operation and we expect to get some of these great yields and we don't see it. It's because it all ties together. It's a big, huge system. If we just increase the number of plants out there, but we didn't listen to what Jim said and we don't increase our fertility, we don't make sure we have enough. One of the things I heard you say, Jim, why you think we're seeing more boron and zinc is because we've raised our yield, right? It's the same thing that we've seen with other nutrients. So as we've raised our yields, we now need more. Part of what's happened with sulfur besides cleaning up the, the coal plants, but it's a big deal. So if we're gonna make a change like that, we have to think about all the parts of the system that we need to change. This is that same slide Jim showed. I just wanted to throw it back in because it's really interesting. Dr. Hatfield does some really good work and he talks about, he's done a lot of work around things I'm gonna talk about later, which is senescence, which is a fancy biological term for maturity or dying of the plant, right? When it senesces, it dies. And in that work that he did, he found that these higher yields had more chlorophyll in them. So there's a direct correlation to photosynthesis and definitely uh, something we need to focus on. So Greg said this this morning, and I love talking about the factories. We've got to keep those factories running. And what do I mean by the factories? Well, within that plant, Jim talked a lot about chlorophyll. But in that plant, to get a little more specific, there's a little structure in there called a chloroplast in that leaf. There's thousands, probably millions of them, right? Those little chloroplasts are the little structures that capture light energy from the sun. And then there's other structures in there that really help uh, take that sunlight and process the, the sugars to make sugars. So what happens is we have this solar panel, which is your corn plant, and we have what we call a light reaction and a dark reaction. The light reaction happens when what? When it's light. Pretty hard to figure that out. But what happens during the light reaction is that's when those chloroplasts gather all that sunlight. The dark reaction doesn't have to have light to happen, and that's when the plant is fixing that carbon dioxide and that water and making those sugars. Those are the two parts of photosynthesis that are really important to think about. But now it's about storage. So just like this solar panel, if we had our house run on solar panels but we didn't have any batteries to to, to be able to store some of that, it'd be a bad day, right? Because at night we wouldn't have power. If we had a cloudy day, we had a storm, we wouldn't have power. We've got to be able to store it. Plants the same way. It throws it in the bank. And so we want to bank as much as we possibly can. And this is a really important part of what I want to talk about today is how do we bank as much as we can? Because what happens with respiration or in the plant is it respires. Greg talked about respiration a little bit this morning. And he talked about transpiration as well. But that respiration piece is when that plant starts burning those sugars. It's using them, right? Just like we're sitting here, if you guys had some donuts this morning like I did, as I'm walking around, I'm burning energy. And so I'm using that to fuel myself. That's what the plant's doing with that, the, the glucose, the sugars that it made. But if it starts burning too much, what happens? It's going to cannibalize itself. So let's go back again to the basics. What is the goal of a plant? It's to reproduce and make progeny. That's it. That's simple. Its whole goal in life is to reproduce and continue that species. So the plant, while it may not be super happy, it'll be okay if it does this, right? We have the same goal, but to a lot larger extent. Our goal is to make as many of those and maximize those out. We want our field to look like this, right? I don't want to just let that plant reproduce. I want to maximize every single kernel that I can. So I want to keep all my factories humming good, I want to continue to make more factories and keep them healthy. <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the stresses. Those of you who heard me talk before, we talk a lot about, about the limiting factors. I like to talk about the, the staves of the barrel, right? The staves of the barrel is basically Justice von Liebig hundreds of years ago figured this out. He had a wooden barrel, had the wooden staves, and he figured out the lowest stave in that barrel is as full as he could fill it with water. It's the same thing with our crop. There's something that impacts our crop from being able to go to the next level. So when we think about limiting factors, lack of nutrients that Jim covered, uh, compaction, you know, I've trained a lot of young agronomists through the years, and the one thing I tell them is, number one, you better never show up to a field without a spade in your truck, and you better never walk into that field without that spade in your hand. Because while it's absolutely critical that we look at the above ground of that plant and we look at those leaves like Greg was showing us this morning, absolutely important, 
but the other half of the story is below ground. And that actually tells me, as an agronomist, a lot more than even the above ground a lot of, a lot of times, because it might be compaction. All the nutrients Jim talked about, majority of the nutrients taken up by that plant are taken up where? In the roots. The water taken up where? In the roots. So if I've got a compaction zone or if I had an insect or if I had something down there that was feeding on those roots or impeding them from getting down, we're going to talk about bullet point out in the field later today. That's what it's all about. How do I get maximum exposure and get roots that look like this in the pit that go really, really deep? You know, water, too much, too little. I'll talk a little bit more about heat, too much or too little. Diseases. Anything that affects that factory is a bad day for us, and we have to think about how we can control it and keep all those factories running. Lack of sunlight. You know, again, last year we saw a lot of cloudy days around here. This year we've had a lot of sunlight, so it's been very good. But again, do we have a factory that's running really well? So the question I'd ask you to think about when you go back to your operation is what's your crop's limiting factor, and what can you do about it? I think I got a sweet spot right over here. I got to stand. Um, so bottom line is we got to control the controllables, right? There's some things that aren't in our control. I can't control if the sun goes behind a cloud for the next three hours. I can't control that it's only going to, you know, get down to make it up 85 degrees tonight. I can't control those things, but I have to think about what I can control and I have to control them and I have to take action. So no different than this Olympic athlete. Uh, I, love, I love the Olympics. I have a lot of fun. I record them all, and I, no offense to the people that like bicycling, but I fast forward through that to get to the swimming and the track and field and the stuff that I like. But no different than an athlete who's training for the Olympics or in the Olympics, you know, there is a limiting factor. There's something that's slowing that, that person down from breaking the record or winning the race. And while 532 bushel per acre of corn yield, which was the, the national corn growers champion last year. That's amazing, right? I think we'd all agree that is phenomenal. But you know what? Even in that field, in that crop, if we could have all gone out and walked it, we could have found something that limited that crop from going beyond that. Because I, I spent, a lot of you that know me know, I spent 18 years at Monsanto in the technical organization, worked with the breeders a lot. And when we get that bag of seed delivered to our farm, we've got 600 plus, plus bushel potential sitting in that bag and it starts just ticking down when we unrip it, right? When we rip it open, we start to not really lose yield, but we're not going to be able to recognize all the yield potential that that has. So even on a really good crop, there's something that limited that from uh, being able to go to the next level. <clears throat> so the two things that I'm going to just talk about here a little bit are heat and diseases. If I can get my slides in the right spot. So I think we all know what this looks like. This is heat stress that's showing up. You know, this, I call this the Goldilocks syndrome because we want it not too hot, but we want it not too cold. We want it just right. And if you think about heat is needed for any biological activity that happens in that crop, in the soil, in the field, we've got to have heat for those microbes to work, for the plant to be able to function. But if we get it too hot, we go through drought stress. What I really want to talk about a little bit is night temperatures. So night temperatures can be a big deal. And Greg mentioned that I was going to talk about this as dark respiration. Again, not to throw a lot of terms out there, but I talked about respiration in that plant. Corn plants are different than cotton and different than soybeans in that they don't go through what we call photorespiration. They don't really do a lot of respiration during the day. They do it at night. And it's a good thing. Respiration is a good thing because it gives that, that plant time to repair itself for any damage that it might have sustained. It gives it time to grow, put on new cells, expand those cells. It does a lot of really important stuff during that, that nighttime. But guess what? Ideal temperature at night is below 70 degrees. So if I can be below 70 degrees, my corn plant's pretty happy because it's also having to cool itself. And if I get cool nights, like Greg was talking about his Texas farm, getting down to 58, fantastic. Right, that plant is so fat, dumb, and happy because it has time to rest, it has time to repair itself, it has time to think about putting on yield, it has time to cool, but it doesn't have to do a lot because it's already cool. If those temperatures at night stay above mid-70s, that plant has to burn a lot more of those sugars that it produced during the day in photosynthesis because now it's doing it not to just repair itself, but it's doing it to stay alive. So that bank that I had over here of that, all those sugars starts getting eaten up even a lot faster 
when it's warmer at night. You know, some of you probably lived through it. I've lived through it. We've seen certain hybrids, genetics, or just certain years where we've had really hot temps at night, and it can just suck the yield right out of that corn plant because it's not able to fill. We end up having lower test weight, or we have more kernels to make a bushel. We have a lot of tips that come back, like Greg showed the white on that, on that one uh, ear that he had. That's what happens, and it's a really bad day. So let me uh, just keep moving along here. The next one is diseases. So diseases come in, they manifest themselves, and they basically destroy our factories. You know, you, maybe you can see it up there uh, on the screen. Greg's got this leaf down here that he showed this morning. You may not think that's a big deal, but that's a big deal. Particularly when you get all those dots and you're taking out factories, that's a big deal because those are reserves I'm not going to be able to put in that bank to use later. Those Diseases also knock out stomates, which is what regulates the respiration and the transpiration. It keeps the moisture in the plant. That's when the stomates close and that plant curls up. That's what we're looking at. So let me talk about how fungicides work and why they're important. And there's a few things here that you may not realize. We all know the obvious. They kill or they suppress diseases. That's typically why we use them, right? One in particular that we've done a lot of work with and I'm familiar with is called paraclostrobin. Uh, we've worked with BSF very closely in a lot of research. It's a, what we call a stroby or a strobal urine uh, fungicide. And there's a couple things it does. The way it works is the mitochondria, which is the structure inside of fungus and inside of the plant that regulates respiration, it basically knocks that out. It slows it down either a bunch into fungus that either makes it suppressed or it kills it. It also has that effect to a little bit lesser extent in the plant, which is a good thing. Because when that fungicide starts to slow down the mitochondria in the plant, it actually slows respiration. So we see a temporary reduction of energy in the plant's mitochondria. The other thing that we do is when we do that, we slow that respiration. It means what? It means we're slowing down, burning some of that, that bank. There were quite a few guys in my neck of the woods here several weeks ago when we were getting into really hot nights that went out and sprayed a fungicide. And it was a good thing to do because it really can help slow down that respiration and it probably kept some top end yield on this great crop that we've got growing around us. The other thing that it does, it's kind of like us having low blood sugar. It actually drives photosynthesis and it drives that nitrogen assimilation in that plant. Basically, it makes it hungry. So when I get hungry, I walk over there and grab another donut. When the plant gets hungry, it starts to create more food, right? It's going to kick into overdrive and and that really is, is being allowed by that fungicide. And then the last thing that, uh, that I think is really, really neat about the strobe fungicides is that it reduces ethylene production in the plant. Everybody knows ethylene, whether you know it or not. If you ever had a banana you bought at the store because they were on sale and they were cheap, but they're really green, and you're thinking, I don't want to wait a week for them to ripen, you could take that banana, you could put it in a paper bag with an apple, and it'll ripen a lot faster, right? That apple's giving off ethylene, all fruits, uh, all plants, basically, when they mature, they create ethylene. That's that senescence I talked about. That's, that ethylene tells the plant to start maturing, start dying, start ripening the fruit. So it's good and bad. You, you guys have all heard Greg and myself and Jim and others talk for a long time about, I want that crop as green as I can when I harvest it because I want to keep it healthy and I want to keep it rolling. I want to keep it going quickly. I'm not going to go through all these plant growth regulators, but these are all very important hormones that appear or happen in the plant. And there's actually some products out there on the market that you can buy and you can use. And again, I'm not advocating if they're good or bad, but again, are they your limiting factor? And if they are, they're out there. Um, the takeaway that I want to talk about though is just how important they are and that if you are using them, placement is key, whether you're going to place them with the seed or whether you're going to place them on the plant itself. So protecting plant health uh, and maximizing photosynthesis is true in all crops. You know, these pictures I have here in the upper left, you'll see cotton. Some of you maybe recognize that, maybe you don't. And the other one below that that you may not recognize is sunflower. Both those pictures were taken here on proving grounds. Uh, hopefully you'll see them on your tram ride there over there a ways. Uh, really cool. We got a nice cotton crop uh, that I was able to work with a friend of mine in the south and get some cotton seed brought up here. But the point is that this is important whether it's a, a soybean plant, a cotton plant, a canola plant, a 
sugar beets, whether it's potatoes. We have our technology be, being used in all those crops just because it's very important to protect that plant health and that photosynthesis regardless of the crop. Um, this was kind of my extra slide. I'm going to try to squeeze it in here, Jim, really quick because I just think this is interesting. Um, corn is what we call a sink-based crop. Soybeans are a source-based limiting crop. And what that means is source and sink. Think about the leaf. That's the source, right? That's where, where all the photosynthesis is being done. That's the factory. That's the source. What's the sink? Sink is where the source is taking everything to. It's either your pot or your ear. So when, when I say that corn is a sink limited crop, what I mean is that ear drives that whole corn plant. That ear size is determined early in its life. And so that plant spends its whole life trying to fill that ear. It will cannibalize itself. It will kill itself trying to fill that ear. Soybeans, on the other hand, and why they're so different is they're source limited, which means that the amount of photosynthesis that each leaf or branch can produce is going to determine how many pods we have, how many we have, how many we fill, how many beans are in each pod. So why do I bring that up and why is it important and what do we do about it? Well, I want you to really think about that because that is key in the way you manage those crops differently. It's all about timing. Jim didn't get into it today because of time, but soybeans really start taking up a lot of those nutrients, that big spike at about R4. So we do a lot of later management in soybeans than we do uh, with corn. So just as I wrap up, coverage is key, and this is the take-home point and how we can think differently. You know, we start thinking about photosynthesis and thinking about protecting those factories. How have we done it historically? And Greg's going to have some neat demos here over lunch, a little surprise for the group that I won't give away. Um, but whether you're applying fungicides, foliar nutrition, insecticides, you've got to think about where you want to put it and where you need it because a lot of those products aren't like Roundup. They're not super mobile in the plant. You don't get them here and they start moving all over. Some of them might move in the leaf, the individual leaf it touches a little bit, but they are not going to be thoroughly mobile in that plant. So if I want to protect all those factories, I need to get all of it protected. And Jim talked a little bit about the backside of the leaf. It's really key and it's really important. So my takeaways are we want to maximize photosynthesis, keep those factories humming. We can do that through using some of these plant protection products to overcome that extreme dark respiration periods we talked about. We can also use those same products to overcome, I can't get this thing to work, I guess it doesn't matter. We can use those same products just to protect our plant health. And then lastly is about coverage. So that's really what I want you to take away is how do I protect my plant? How do I protect it where I need it? And coverage is going to be key. And you're going to see some really neat demos as you're out uh, around with water sensitive paperwork we've done uh, where we look at traditional ways that we apply those products versus uh, the ways that, that uh, we can do it today with some of the technology we have here.